Hi there, it's December 20th and time for Luke chapter 20 in our Christmas with Luke series. Let's jump over there and we'll get into it. Now we know he's on his way to Jerusalem and he's getting very close. So, One day Jesus was teaching the people and preaching the good news in the temple. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law and the elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Let me ask you a question first, he replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, or is it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask why he, why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us because they are convinced John was a prophet. So they finally replied they didn't know. <laughs> And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by authority what I choose to do these things. There you go. Proverbs says, don't talk to fools, right? <laughs> Parable of the evil farmers. Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and moved to another country to live for several years. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and then sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. A third, a third man was sent, and they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do? The owner asked. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they'll respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw his son, they said to each other, here comes the heir to this estate. Let's kill him and get this estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. Sound familiar? What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do then? Jesus asked him. I tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. How terrible that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at him and said, Then what does this scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And there's a note there. Psalm 118.22 Everyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. Hmm? A rock that makes them fall. stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. The teachers of religious law and the leading priests wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling the story against them. <laughs> they were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Right. They claim they're waiting for the kingdom of God to come, but when it comes, they like their positions, they like their robes, they like their money, they like their big houses. Taxes for Caesar. Waiting for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor, so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now these are spies, right? Okay. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery. Very wise. Show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer, and they became silent. <laughs> Love it. Discussion about the resurrection. <laughs> then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees. Now, Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in an afterlife. They believe all you have is the life you're given, and then it's over. They were sad, you see. The pastor told me that. I did not make that up. <clears throat> Religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. That's what I said. They pose this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies leaving a wife with no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. And that's in Deuteronomy. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven. 
of them who died without children. Finally, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Now remember, they don't believe in the resurrection. For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, marriage is for people here on earth. But in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. Okay. This. There's a lot of talk that when you die, you become an angel. No. People do not become angels. Angels are lower on the hierarchy than humans. Humans are created directly in the image of God. And angels are below that. You don't become an angel. Okay. It says, in this respect, they will be like the angels, which means they will never die. And they can't die because they live forever like angels. Angels never die. You know, even the bad angels will be sent to hell and then sent to the fiery, you know, to the lake of fire and they will never die. Okay. So, but now as to whether the dead will be raised... Even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Japheth. So is he the God of the living, not the dead, for they are all alive to him. Right? <laughs> well said, teacher, remarked some of the teachers of religious law who were standing there, and then no one dared ask him any more questions. <laughs> right? Whose son is the Messiah? Then Jesus presented them with a question. Why is it, he asked, that the Messiah is said to be the son of David? For David himself wrote in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. And that was in Psalm 110. Since David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Okay, when you call somebody Lord, that's the ultimate title of authority. Lord means somebody that is above you, that has total control over your life, and you will do whatever they say. That's when you call somebody Lord, it's not to be taken lightly. Okay. So what he's saying is they, they're calling him the son of David because he was in the succession of the line of David, Okay, which means he was far down. But David referred to the Messiah as Lord, which means somebody that is above him. Okay. That's what he said. Since David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Then, with the crowds listening, he turned to his disciples and said, Beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes. I'm going to highlight this, okay? So they like to, they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogue and and the head table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly ch cheat widows of their property and pretend to be pious, making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be severely punished. Now think about this. They were doing this back then, okay? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they loved all their... Is this going on today? You bet it is, okay? There's a lot of mega church and TV pastors that they love their private jets and their big mansions and their robes and their positions. and But they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. You know, I, don't, I mean, I don't watch TV. I haven't watched TV in years and years and years. But I remember when the old 700 Club and all that stuff used to be on back in the 80s. They were always cheating money out of widows. My poor grandmother, who lived on a $500 a month Social Security check, was constantly sending these people money. You know, because they said, if I don't get $500, I'm going to die, or the Lord's going to strike me down, or I won't get a new jet, or any any number of excuses. But they were cheating, cheating widows, and my grandmother was a widow. They were cheating, cheating these people out of their money still going on today. They're selling books. But Jesus said over and over, whenever he required a rich man to said, how do I get to heaven? He always said, sell everything you own and give it to the poor and follow me. So if these mega pastors are following Jesus, but they have 
jets and mansions and big cars and limousines and yachts and airplanes. If they want to follow Jesus, why don't they sell everything they own and give to the poor? There's plenty of poor everywhere. You know, they don't have to live like that. It's not biblical to live like that. So, but I could get on that soapbox and be on it for a long time. <laughs> but so Jesus is telling us some very, very wise things that are still going on today. So that's chapter 20 in Luke. We're getting towards the end. I mean, you know, pretty soon, you know, he's going to get there and they're going to finally do it. And we know how it ends, but we'll have it all wrapped up by Sunday night. You know, it's on Wednesday, so we have four chapters left. So, so until next time, keep praying, keep reading. Hug somebody. Give to the poor. You'll get it back. See you later.